Well, once again, good morning, everybody. Could you use some encouragement? Me too. So we are talking these days about really the darkest moment in David's life when he made a major boo-boo, and uh, he took another man's wife, and then he killed her husband to cover it up. And those are the facts. It's, it's really that simple. So these previous two weekends, and now this weekend, we are talking about the implications of that in David's life. So if you missed the last two weekends, I'm urging you to please get online and uh, catch the last two weekends because we're spending three weekends with David and Bathsheba. Week number one, we went verse by verse through those two chapters, chapters 10 and 11 of 2 Samuel, where the story is laid out. Last week, we talked about why people commit adultery. This week, we're talking about how to uh, make our marriage or our vital relationship adultery-proof or affair-proof, okay? That's where we're going. But first of all, I want to talk to you about boys and girls, and I want to talk to you about what it was like when we first discovered, you know, the opposite sex and all the wonder of romance and quit acting like the sophisticated, highly intelligent, accomplished people you are and be in the third grade again for just a few moments, okay? So all of us were in the third grade hanging out by the drinking fountain and dude, there she comes. Watch this. So these kids are answering this question. Here's the first one. How do you decide who to marry? This is Alan, age 10. He says, well, you got to find somebody who likes the same stuff. Like, if you like sports, she should like it that you like sports. And she should keep the chips and dip coming. <laughs> See, that is a kid that's going to have a great marriage. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Okay. Kristen, age 10, says this. Well, no person really decides before they grow up who they're going to marry. God decides it all way before. And you get to find out later who you're stuck with. Okay. <laughs> So I hope Alan doesn't marry Kristen. That isn't going to work out well. Here's the next question. What is the right age to get married? This is Camille, and she's 10 years old. She says, well, 23 is the best age, because by then you've known the person forever. <laughs> How can a stranger tell if two people are married? This is my all-time favorite. How can you tell if two people are married? Derek, age 8, says, you might have to guess based on whether they seem to be yelling at the same kids. <laughs> that is great stuff there. <clears throat> what do you think your mom and dad have in common? Lori, age eight, says, both don't want no more kids. <laughs> now, what do most people do on a date? For, so for those of you that are lining up a hot weekend next weekend, see if this isn't just a little bit true. What do most people do on a date? Well, Lynette, age eight, says... Uh, dates are for having fun, and people should use them to get to know each other. Even boys have something to say if you listen long enough. <laughs> Martin, age 10, adds this about what most people do on a date. On the first date, people just tell each other lies, and that usually gets them interested enough to go on a second date. <laughs> Isn't that about the truth? We are so phony in dating. We're all cleaned and scrubbed and smelling good, looking good, but that ain't who we really are, man. Come the next day, is it? Here's another one. When is it okay to kiss someone? Pam, age seven, says, when they're rich. <laughs> when is it okay to kiss someone? Kurt, age seven, says, well, the law says you gotta be 18, so I wouldn't mess too much with that. When is it okay to kiss someone? Howard, age eight, says, can't you just see Howard, the little sober kid, little serious guy? The rule goes like this. If you kiss someone, then you should marry them and have kids with them. It's just the right thing to do. <laughs> is it better to be single or to be married? Uh, Anita, age nine, says, it's better for girls to be single, but not for boys, because boys need someone to clean up after them. <laughs> Ouch! How would the world be different if people did not get married? Kevin, age eight, says, well, there sure would be a lot of kids to explain, wouldn't there? <laughs> Here's my other favorite one. If you meet with a family member or friends for lunch after, and they say, so what'd you learn in church today? Just tell them this next one. How would you make marriage work? Ricky, age 10, says, tell your wife that she looks pretty, 
even if she looks like a dump truck. <laughs> uh, you got to love kids. I grew up with a pastor that was my mentor, Glenn Cole, and he always said, you know what marriage is? It's oceans of emotions surrounded by expanses of expenses. There's also truth in that. Uh, take your notes in hand, if you would, and by the way, with you version, you can digitally uh, access notes that way as well. Let's talk about where we've been the last couple weeks very quickly, just in about a minute or so, just to thread everybody in so we're aligned So adultery and fornication are when we have sex with somebody that we're not married to. And God says, I have created this beautiful gift for you called sexuality. And with this amazingly powerful, bonding, joy, joyous, pleasurable gift called sex that I'm giving you, I'm also giving you a healthy parameter so that you can express it freely without guilt or inhibition, and that's called marriage, okay? We should not be ashamed to talk about what God was not ashamed to create. And God created sexuality. So we're going to talk about it some more this weekend. Uh, I'm going to be tasteful, but I'm going to be honest, and I'll be thoroughly biblical. But if the local church does not speak about this all-important topic, then we are allowing people that, wa- that may have a wildly divergent approach, philosophy, value system to inform our sons and daughters and our grandchildren, and I am simply saying I'm not willing to abdicate that. I hope you're talking to your kids about sex from a biblical perspective because they're going to get their information somewhere. I hope you're not just by default hoping the internet informs them, right? Okay. So God created this beautiful gift called sexuality when we color outside the lines Uh, As David did with Bathsheba, we commit adultery. And the Bible says, in fact, adultery is a sin. And it's a sin against five. It's a sin against God. It's a sin against our spouse. It's a sin against our own body. It's a sin against our church family. And it's a sin against the other person. Now, before you think God's a cosmic killjoy, or what gives? He gives us this amazing gift called sex, and then he says, no, 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 no. God does not say no, 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 no. He equally, if we rightly understand the Bible, equally says yes, 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 yes. It just depends on what we're focusing on. The reason God says the beauty and power of sexuality is only for marriage is because he wants to safeguard and protect the most important relationships in our life, which are marriage and parenting. I mentioned to you last weekend that I have yet, in over 30 years of pastoral ministry, ever met a happy adulterer. In other words, I've never had anybody, uh, you know, skip gaily into my office and say, oh, goody, goody, John, today I've had yet another encounter with adultery, and I'm just loving it. They do have a few moments of pleasure, but for a moment of pleasure, they invite a lifetime of pain. And when the whole house of cards come raveling down and they're sobbing hysterically in in unspeakable brokenness in their life, they say, how did this happen to me? We're going to talk about how this happens to people just like you and me. And it's going to deal this morning with matters of the heart. Because God is rooting for us, God is pulling for us, and God has given us an incredible amount of practical, common sense wisdom for how we can affair-proof our lives and our mate and our lifestyle and our marriage, okay? Now, we said last week when we talked about why people commit adultery that there are four reasons that we commit adultery. Uh, We commit adultery because of emotional immaturity, and there are different kinds of emotional immaturity. We talked about that last weekend. Check it out. Uh, Secondly, we commit adultery because of unresolved conflict, Thirdly, we commit adultery because of unmet needs. When you uh, connect with last weekend's teaching, we talked about his needs, her needs, the five top needs of men, the five top needs of women. If you're a man here and have no clue what the five top needs of women are, you got to check with last weekend's teaching because we talk about it. A lot of guys are clueless, and in priority, what's the most important thing 
to a woman. That may be why you're home again alone on Friday night if you're a single adult. Ladies, are you aware of the top five needs of men and in order of priority in the masculine soul? Married or single, you really need to be aware of these things. And the fourth reason we commit adultery, honestly, is unbridled lust. That's probably why David committed adultery. David already had concubines for sexual pleasure. He had wives for political and military alliance. Did he really need another beautiful woman? No, he didn't. But he sends his army out the war. He stays behind. I think he'd been checking Bathsheba out for some time. And then when he could, bam, he took her. And then the whole house of cards begins to come down around him. And then he has to murder her her husband, to cover up his sexual immorality. It's a tragic story. You say, John, how could this happen in a guy's heart like David? I thought he was a man after God's own heart. Yes, he is. The Bible says in Jeremiah, the heart is very deceitful and wicked and very difficult to fully understand. And each one of us in this room, all of us together, we are vulnerable to do just about anything at any time given the right set of circumstances and especially if we think we can get away with it in anonymity. Remember that God knows our heart and again, God is our Father and He's pulling for us, that He's gifted us with this beautiful gift of sexuality and He says, if you'll wait on my timing in your life and if you will trust me, I've got the right man for you. I have the right woman for you. But please wait Father knows best. Let's talk about how to make our marriage affair proof or adultery proof. Now, if you're not married, you will need to know this stuff one day, or maybe you're in a vibrant dating or engagement relationship. You also need to know this stuff one day. Let's talk about the three ways that we affair proof our vital relationship. And the first is this we've got to affair proof ourselves. Uh, We're going to spend probably 15 to 20 minutes here because this is the most important of the three. We can't control what other people do. The only thing we can really control is our heart and how we respond and the decisions that we make. So we need to affair proof ourselves and it begins by making a commitment to God of sexual purity and of sexual faithfulness. And a commitment to that purity and that integrity for the rest of our days. Now, I know what many of you are thinking. You're saying, good night. Is John serious about this? First of all, you need to know, this isn't John's stuff. This is God's stuff. I realize it flies in the face of conventional wisdom in the East Bay and in the Bay Area. I am pretty well read. I stay threaded in. I love to be connected with this fabulous region and people in which we live and work and do ministry and life together, right? I realize this is wildly ridiculous. I'm simply saying let God be true and every man a liar. If we will make that kind of commitment to sexual integrity, God will invite his favor and his blessing upon our lives. Now, We each have two choices when it comes to sexual temptation. I want you to fill them in, would you please? Choice one is to nurture temptation. Choice two is to attack temptation. Let me play those out very briefly. If we nurture temptation, do you know what it is? It's very easy to do. It's the path of least resistance. It's no problemo. It's no sweat. It's even fun because we're doing what comes natural. We're doing what we want to do. We're obeying our glandular instincts, right? And so we nurture temptation. It requires no moral strength, no moral character, but neither does it build any. So instead of attacking uh, temptation sexually, if we nurture temptation, what we are doing is incubating scenarios in our mind of fantasy. In other words, we're creating all sorts of extramarital scenarios in our minds. Romantic evenings, candlelight dinners, sexual encounters. And at that point, our imagination or fantasy then leads to temptation, which will at some point almost inevitably lead to our acting out the temptation and sinning in ways that are going to be devastating to our lives. I guess what I'm saying in part is this. If we will not sin with our minds we have a high likelihood we'll not, ups, we'll not end up sinning with our bodies. It begins with the battle of the mind 
and of the heart. That's if we nurture temptation. What happens if we, number two, attack temptation? And we say, with God's help, I will control my thought life. What happens if we go that approach? Look at the one verse I've included there. I want you to read it together with me. It's a good one. I want everybody in the house to maybe make this part of your spiritual arsenal, okay? Check it out. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. Read it with me. Go. Take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Let's say it again. Take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Now, listen, God is not going to ask us to do something that's impossible to do. He will help us if we decide to be people of mental integrity so that we can be morally and sexually pure. God will help us. Three reasons that God wants us to attack temptation. First of all, because we love Jesus Christ. Secondly, because we love our mate and our children. Do you know the devastating consequence when people uh, be, enter into an extramarital affair and the vast majority of time they will be found out? The greater pain is not just the devastating loss of mate, it's the way their children will look at them for the rest of their natural life. It's that kind of shame, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. That person becomes known in, in the family. I hear families say this. Well, yeah, Marv, he's the one that committed adultery and left his wife and ran off with his secretary. And that is kind of the, 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 the description or the definition. It feels kind of like a family betrayal. I'm saying to you, please don't put yourself in this position to invite that kind of broken legacy in your lives. Make a vow, keep a vow. Make a vow, keep a vow. That's what marriage vows are about. You say, John, you don't know how hard it is. Oh, yeah, I do. And also, Carrie knows how hard it is. We are not somehow immune or exempt just because we're something called a pastor from all the difficulties and challenges of everyday marriage and rearing four children together and bills and life and stress and deadlines and all of our humanity and selfishness, it just takes constant renewal to the vow and the promise that we made to God and to each other. And i got to be honest, there's some days it ain't pretty, but we are hanging in there because the next day is usually a little bit better. Never throw in the towel in a bad season, right? The third reason that we attack temptation is because, and I don't say this to induce fear, but it is thoroughly biblical. And if I'm going to be a good pastor that truly loves your soul, I need to say this, that we will one day stand before God and give an accounting for our life. The Bible clearly teaches in 2 Corinthians 5.10, for we must each appear before the judgment seat of Christ and give an accounting. Now, one of the things about David that's interesting, he finally learned, it seemed. Uh, what happens when people get old often? Well, a number of things happen, but one of the things is often when you get old, you get cold. You have lower blood circulation and you're always chilled. I first learned about this when I was seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, living in a little country farm cottage with my elderly grandmother. She was 88, I was about 12, we were best friends. Sound weird, she changed my life. She was an awesome lady. But she was always cold. And she wanted our little house, about 500 square feet. I lived with her in the summer. She had glaucoma, so I was basically her eyes and ears. And, you know, farm kids drive mach machinery in the fields pretty quick, so you drive cars too. And I'm taking her to get her hair done and that kind of stuff, you know, and that's kind of the relationship we had. But we had this temperature issue. And she'd have it 95 degrees in there. We're sweltering. And she's not looking. I told you she has glaucoma, and I'd turn it down. And she'd come in there, Johnny, did you? And she'd turn it up, and I'd turn it down. She'd, okay, David grew old and had low blood circulation and got cold. They didn't have central heating in those days. You had to sleep with somebody. And they found a beautiful Hebrew virgin young woman named Abishag. Weird name, pretty girl. And she slept with David, but not sexually, just to keep the elderly king's physical body warm. The Bible's very specific that David had no intimate relations with her. Because he's probably thinking when that pretty girl is near him, he's thinking, I did this before and it didn't turn out very good. So this time, I ain't going to mess around. But by then, the damage had been done. Uh, you realize that the kind of conduct that parents excuse in moderation, 
their children will live in excess. So if you think David was a little bit of an ethical issue sexually, oh boy, wait until we talk in a moment about his son, Solomon, who became his heir and the next king of the nation, okay? We will stand before God is the third reason. Now, I want you just to listen hard for the next 60 seconds to these biblical verses. Maybe just jot down the reference. Hebrews 13, 4. Marriage should be honored by all and the marriage bed kept pure for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. You say, John, that's harsh. No, it's actually very loving because what is God trying to safeguard and protect? Our marriages and our children and the whole legacy of our life. From Proverbs chapter 14, there is a way that seems right to a man or woman, but in the end it leads to death. A wise man or woman fears the Lord and shuns evil. He who fears the Lord has a secure fortress, and for his children it will be a refuge. For the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life, turning a man and woman from the snares of death. For the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Look at that passage of Scripture on the front page of your notes. It's Proverbs chapter 5 and chapter 6, and it's written by David's son Solomon, whom I just referenced a moment ago. By the way, who was Solomon's mom? Right, Bathsheba. Do you want to talk about an act of amazing grace? The very woman that David stole from another man and then murdered her husband Uriah to cover up? I mean, how, how much worse a sin can you possibly commit the first child died a boy you remember that in the story they had another son who was Solomon maybe you saw him on the video presentation we've given you over the last couple weekends it was that Solomon that God used to write a book called Proverbs it was that Solomon that gives us the best biblical advice about how to affair proof ourselves the only problem is The giver of this advice could not keep his own advice. Solomon, at the height of his influence, and he was a a king, honestly, not just of regional, but at that time of global renown and influence. At the height of his life, he had 700 concubines and 300 wives. And again, wives were usually for political or military alliance. I mean, again, what parents excuse in moderation Children will wildly live in excess, and we see it demonstrated here. So we're going to read these verses together. I'm going to read them to you very quickly. You follow along. The only other thing I want to add before we read them is a word to the ladies. Gals, it seems really unfair sometimes in the Bible that the Bible seems to be unfair to how it presents or treats women. And this is another one of those cases because in that context, it makes it look like the woman is the sole immoral one seducing or enticing the innocent man who just has nothing to do with wrong, eh, gong you. Uh, Men or women are equally responsible or culpable. Remember, the Bible was not inspired in 21st century America. It was inspired in antiquity in, in the ancient near Middle East. Radically different worldview. And it was a patriarchal culture, meaning man dominated. Women were seen in some sense almost as property. Uh, I'm not saying it's right. In fact, it's very wrong, but it's what it was uh, in the whole cult, in most cultures of that era. In fact, a man could not speak to a woman in a public setting outside the home that was not his mother, his grandmother, his wife, his daughter. Uh, or his sister. You, a man was not allowed. So when Jesus in John chapter 4 is speaking to this uh, Samaritan woman who was with a lot of men, it was a wild social taboo. Jesus was always willing to fight through taboos so that he could love people one at a time. I just want to say the women, the woman is not the bad person in God's sight on the weight of all of Scripture. I just wanted to add kind of that uh, caveat contextually, okay? Check it out with me. Proverbs 5 and 6. Solomon writes, For the lips of an adulteress drip honey, 
and her speech is smoother than oil, but in the end she's bitter as gall, sharp as a double-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps lead straight to the grave. She gives no thought to the ways of life. Her paths are crooked. She knows it not. Now then, my sons, listen to me and do not turn aside from what I say. Keep to a path far from her. Do not go near the door of her house lest you give your best strength to others and your years to one who is cruel, lest strangers feast on your wealth and your toil enrich another man's house. At the end of your life you will grow when your flesh and body are spent. You will say how I hated discipline, how I spurned correction. I would not obey my teachers or listen to my instructors. I have come to the brink of utter ruin in the midst of the whole assembly. For these commands are a lamp. This teaching is a light. And the corrections are discipline of the way of life, keeping you from the immoral woman or man, from the smooth tongue of the wayward wife or husband, Do not lust in your heart after his or her beauty or let them captivate you with their eyes for the prostitute reduces you to a loaf of bread the adulteress preys upon your very life. Can a man or woman scoop fire into their lap without their clothes being burned? Can a man or woman walk on hot coals without their feet being scorched? So is he or she who sleeps with another person's spouse. The one who touches her will not go unpunished. Whoa! That's heavy-duty stuff. It's stuff we need to hear in 21st century Bay Area culture. Four life applications. Fill them out as we go along. There's a place for you to do that in your notes. First of all is the principle of lifestyle. Do you notice in verse number 8, keep a path far from her. Don't go near the door of her house. Fill it in, then look at me. Do you know what the application for you and I in this day is? Each one of us have vulnerable places in our lives and vulnerable patterns in our lives. And you know what they are, and so do I, about myself. What I'm saying is we need to be real, and the Bible is saying if we struggle with a particular thing, to put ourselves in the proximity of that where we can indulge ourselves once again, whether it's something sexual or whether it's alcohol or whether it's some kind of conduct unbecoming that is personally destructive, we almost certainly will cave and capitulate and fall. That's principle one, is lifestyle. Principle two, fill it in, is the word satisfying as in satisfying marriage. Make note of that, would you please? Notice chapter 5, verse 15 and 18. Drink from your own cistern. Rejoice in the wife of your youth. Now some of y'all don't even know what a cistern is, and it ain't the opposite of a brethren, okay? (laughs) A cistern is a big deal in Bible days. Why? It's a source of clean drinking water. Clean, cold, sweet drinking water. And that's what clean, cold, sweet drinking water does. What does it do? It quenches our what? Our thirst. Just like a vibrant, living, loving, passionate marriage relationship that is deeply satisfying satisfies and quenches our sexual nature. That's the imagery clearly being taught here in these uh, verses by Solomon in chapter 5 and 6. In other words, if we have a satisfying marriage and a healthy sexual relationship in that satisfying marriage, and just remember this, that's going to be a bad half hour if the other 23 and a half hours are nothing but fighting and ignoring and anger and wrath and hostility and unforgiveness and bitterness, right? We all know that. When we have a satisfying marriage, we give our marriage, uh, uh, because it's based on a healthy sexual relationship also, we give our marriage the best chance to succeed long term. In other words, a marriage the Bible teaches will never reach its full potential until a couple regularly and mutually has a satisfying sexual relationship. When that happens, we affirm that God has made us as sexual beings. We know guilt-free shame-free sexual expression, and we use our body to bring pleasure to our mate and vice versa. The Bible teaches satisfying marriage. Third thing we learned from Solomon, write in the word thought, as in thought life. Notice verse 25 of chapter 6, do not lust in your heart after her beauty. Now, notice, it is lust 
not love. I tell high school and junior high guys all the time, you think it's love, it's not. It's lust, and you're in heat, and you just don't know the difference. See? Okay, it is lust. What is this thing of in your heart? Uh, the Bible and, and the idea of the ancients spiritually and psychologically is that the heart was the seat of will and decision. It's the decider part of who we are as human beings created in, in God's image. So the Bible is saying do not lust out in the deciding willful part of who you are and cave and capitulate. Rather, take captive every thought and make it obedient to Jesus Christ. Remember, external is temporary, internal is eternal. And the fourth one I want you to fill in is the word decision. Look at chapter 7, verse 25. Do not let your heart turn to her ways or stray into her paths. It is a choice of will. Now remember this. The theologians would say we're free volitional creatures, which means we're free to choose. And that is true. But let me tell you what we're not free to do. We're not free to choose the consequences, only the decisions. The consequences are built into the decisions. So when we make decisions that align with God's truth, God's wisdom, God's loving uh, principles for our lives, we invite his favor and blessing. Those are the consequences that we invite. If your life is filled with heartache and headache and pain and dysfunction, shame, guilt, just deep pain, there is a good chance that if you carefully analyze your decisions of the last weeks, months, and years, you will see a pattern of decision making. Not always, but most likely, where you've made decisions that have invited very painful consequence in your life. I've done that in my life. I've done dumb stuff. Anybody else here done dumb stuff besides me? Good, you make me feel better. Half of you are in honest and the rest of you are in denial. Remember, <laughs> denial ain't a river in Egypt. You know what I'm saying? Okay, I want you to write down these three words. We, we alluded to them last week. Character is destiny. What you and I become when we're tottering old men and women. Say we're in our 80s, we're in our 90s, we hit triple digits. The sum total of our life will be the accumulation of our character and the decisions that issued forth from who we are within. And we've got to decide what kind of a heritage and legacy we want to build today so we leave that kind of a heritage and legacy we're proud of tomorrow and a legacy that greatly honors God. There is a time to pull a Joseph and run. Do not pray about it. In areas of vulnerability in your life, do not ever pray about stuff the Bible's crystal clear about. I have people come to me and say, you know, I'm just praying about divorcing her. Well, is there any reason? No, I'm just tired of her. Don't love her anymore. I'm just praying about whether I should do that. Quit praying about that. That's a stupid prayer. You're not only ticking me off, you're ticking God off. People come to me and say, I'm praying about tithing. Don't pray about that, either tithe or don't tithe. God's already given his verdict on the topic, and I could go on down the line. We make it far more complicated. This book is not written by God for rocket scientists. It's written for ordinary men and women just like you and me. And 99% of the will of God for our lives is crystal clear in this book if we're honest with ourselves and we will not just hear truth, but live truth. Now, a word to teenagers and singles. I want you to write down 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3. Those of you with teenage children, you parents, I hope you talk to your sons and daughters about this. I did. I'm not saying get a coffee table Bible and whack them over the head and concuss them, you know, give them a concussion. I'm saying begin to talk to them at the right age, you'll know what that is, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. You wouldn't believe what little eight-year-olds are talking about on the playground. And if you ain't got any clue, trust me, talk to any of our student leaders around this campus, our youth pastors. They'll tell you the kind of stuff that kids know at six, seven, eight years old that I didn't know at 17, 18, 19 years old. Here's 1 Thessalonians 4, 3. It is God's will that you avoid sexual immorality and live a holy life. It's God's will. I'm a bad pastor if I don't tell you the whole truth. 
Do you know what Josh McDowell would tell us? He'd say the majority of American teenagers lose their virginity and engage in premarital sex between 3 and 5 o'clock in the afternoon in their own home with their parents gone on their parents' bed, unquote. Here's what I'm saying. If because of the nature of your work, you have latchkey children, I mean, you got to do what you got to do, right? But get a strategy. Don't just give a 14-year-old the keys to the kingdom or a 16-year-old. You say, well, they may not like it. Who's asking them? We're the parents here. And it starts earlier where we say, hey, listen, in our home, and even if you're a single parent, in our home, this is how we do stuff. And I'm simply saying, have some reasonable boundaries where you say, these are the moral boundaries of who we are as a family. Now, when you leave my home, when you pay your own mortgage, you can do what you do. You can do your own deal. But it's my job to try to fashion a character and, a, and who you are within that's going to bless you for the rest of your days. And you're angry at me my now, right now, my son or daughter. I love you more than I fear your anger. I'm going to do the right thing, and away we go. Right? Okay. Now, uh, Dick Dobbins is very insightful when he helps teens understand that the beautiful gift of sex, uh, the bonding capacity of sexuality, uh, is like adhesive tape. Think of scotch tape. Adhesive tape is not made for repetitive use. The strongest bond of tape is capable of making is the first surface to which it's attached. That's the greatest... Adhesion. It can be ripped off and taped to something else, but it's not quite as sticky the second time as it was the first time. It can be ripped off again and taped to something else, but it's not as sticky the third time as it was the second time or the first time. In other words, what Dick is saying is that if we continue the practice of just having a recreational sexual strategy in our lives, have it with whoever we want as often as we want it and just throw caution to the wind, there will be a point where there is no adhesiveness left in our soul to attach to any surface. The Bible says all other sins a person commits are outside their body, but he who sins sexually sins against their own body because we become one in body with that other human being. And so when we bond that way sexually with person after person after person, it's as though we give a little part of our heart away each time. It's just like we carve and rip out of our very chest a little piece of our essence and give it away. We see this all the time. I don't mean to hurt anybody's feelings. I've got nothing but love in my heart. I'm deeply committed to your well-being, to your future greatness in God, to your health, to your happiness, uh, to the deepest longings of your heart as you become the man or woman God's destined you to be. But we've got to talk about this stuff and be really honest because we saw, we see it here in this series on David, bring down the greatest kingdom in the history of the nation of Israel, this very issue of sexuality run amok. Remember this, you build intimacy from commitment, not commitment from intimacy. I say it again, you build intimacy intimacy from commitment. The commitment has got to be there and then follows the sexual side of the relationship. In American culture today, sex is a way to say thanks for a good first date. Here's the only question I'm, I'm asking. If, if we do that, what's left? What's next? And why should that person even stay around? He or she already got what they wanted. I'm simply saying to you as somebody that loves your soul, uh, please think carefully about these things and their implications uh, in our lives together. It's easy to bear our body. It's much harder to bear our soul. And we're a nation great at bearing our body, but we have great soulish want, great deficit internally and spiritually. Okay, we got to wrap up point one. We're going to be very quick in point two and three. So we talked about affair-proofing ourselves. Let's talk about affair-proofing our mate, number two. The word is Mate. Can I tell you the only way I know to a fair proof our spouses, our mates, is to keep our lawns, our marital lawns, so green that every other lawn looks brown in comparison. Now, in drought-stricken California, we really understand that, don't we? Apparently, we're going into our fourth year of drought. Really feel for the central farmers. So, if you have a brown marriage lawn, what will fix it 
is not escaping that marriage, taking all your unresolved baggage and backpacking it into a new brown marriage. It's to water the brown lawn where you're at. Eventually, that brown grass will begin slowly but surely to green up. If you want green grass, water that sucker. Now, let me say with love, and I'm saying some things that are very honest today. Some of us may be accidentally, even unconsciously, uh, driving our spouse into another person's arms because we are living in a way that is selfish. We're taking them for granted. We're not present in the relationship anymore. I mean, our physical body's there, but we ain't there. So I just want to give you some practical tips about turning a brown marriage green because some of you may have relationships so barren that a patch of asphalt looks healthy, right? <laughs> now, I'm not looking at anybody when I say these things. I'm looking down, <laughs> okay? I'm just saying. I'm not looking at any of you. Here's some, here's some practical tips, and I'm only saying these because I hear these all the time. Here's one. Lose some weight. Be attractive again. Don't worry you can't fit in your wedding dress or your tuxedo. I mean, did you ever see that stupid thing, Steve, Steve Martin in Father of the Bride and One, he goes up in the attic and gets the tuxedo? Do you see that horrid-looking thing? Don't do that. But lose some weight, take care of yourself. Here's another one, I'm not looking at you. Dress nice. Here's another one, smell nice. Here's another one, have a weekly date. Here's another one, speak nice. Here's another one, listen. Here's another one, <laughs> pay attention. Here's another one. Engage. Be present. Listen with your eyes. What happens is we begin to take the most important relationship in our life for granted. Remember what we said last weekend. When we make a marriage vow, vows don't keep themselves. We have to keep them. And if there's been drift in our marriage and it went from once upon a time being vibrant green and now it's turning an unhappy shade of brown, we can undo what we did to get it that way in the first place. Number three, let's wrap up. We need to affair proof our lifestyle. Do you know where most extramarital affairs begin? All the research says number one, close personal friends, number two, workplace, co workers. Listen to a leading magazine. The workplace atmosphere itself fosters the budding of romance. Everybody's dressed for success. Receptionists stream calls. Night cleaners keep things spotless. Expense accounts cover long lunches and four-star restaurants. Leisurely drinks after work to talk over the day's events. Business trips to luxury hotels with room service, hot tubs, and swimming pools. Companies unwittingly promote intimate relationship by setting up work teams that are frequently male-female. We have a saying around our office that you have to fall in love a little bit to work well together, unquote. Now, I'm not saying be a prude or be paranoid. Certainly have really healthy friendships with the opposite sex. Just be aware of the way God has hardwired us. Just be alert. Just be aware and put some appropriate boundaries in place. Let me suggest a few. Avoid meals alone with people of the opposite sex. Avoid riding alone in a car with somebody other than your spouse. Avoid meeting people uh, alone with people of the opposite sex. Avoid counseling with the opposite sex. You know what happens in these long, intimate relationships? Transference happens. And what began is one person bearing his or her soul and just pouring it all out. And if the other person is a sensitive, tender-hearted, mercy person, pretty soon they really begin to kick, uh, connect at a soulish level, at a heart level, and then follows a warm smile, and then a gentle touch, and then a hug, and then a kiss, and you can figure out the rest of the story. It happens again and again and again. And this isn't about being some kind of sterile, frigid prudes religiously. It's about being wise so that we can live lives of integrity before the Lord that leaves a legacy that greatly honors God. Avoid people of the opposite sex developing an emotional dependence on you. How many of you know what an emotional affair is? Let me, let me give you some of the, uh, the uh, describers of an emotional affair. You consistently look forward to spending time with someone who isn't your spouse. You begin to dress up and care more about your personal appearance when you know you will be seeing that person that day. You create ways to bump into or, or coincidentally run across the other person, going to great lengths to know his or her daily or weekly schedule. 
You look for opportunities to be alone with that person. You find yourself mentally comparing that person with your spouse, wishing your spouse was more like him or her. You fantasize about that person. You begin looking for verbal and physical, physical cues from that person to confirm their interest in you. You begin to notice all your spouse's negative traits and all the other person's positive traits. Martin Luther said it well. He said, you can't stop the birds from flying over your head, but you can stop them from making a nest there. And what we are talking about in this teaching this weekend is matters of the heart, how to affair-proof ourselves, our mate, and our lifestyle. Because when we as Christians say no to non-marital sex, we are saying yes to something far better. And everyone said, would you stand for closing prayer, dear friends? So sorry I went over this weekend. Thank you for your kind patience. Would you bow your heads in prayer and tightly close your eyes, giving everybody a moment of privacy? I want to pray for you right now as we wrap up. If you need prayer for anything that is relevant to you that we've talked together in Bible study, in any way, and you say, John, I need God in this particular area of my life, I want you to raise your hand to all across the room right now. Raise them high. Yes, 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 yes. Lots of hands. Put them up and keep them up. No one's looking. It's between you and God. Put them up and keep them up. Is there anybody else? This could be your moment of confession that sets you free. Is there anybody else you need to put up your hand? Please heed the prompting of God's Holy Spirit. He loves you so much. So Holy God, you see the hands across the house and you love uniquely, perfectly each man and woman. Intervene in their life, God, in the specific circumstance that they're now thinking about and meditating about and worried about or broken about in their life relative to their marriage or relative to a relationship. And I pray that you infuse much grace and mercy into that person's life right now. Wash all of their sins away. Make them clean and whole. God, and in terms of the circumstances that they have put in motion, I pray by grace that you modify those circumstances and God, give them a fresh second chance. May your love be so evident and real for each person in the house in Jesus' name. And everyone said, hold steady for just one moment before we leave. If you need to talk to somebody about anything going on in your life, the I raised my hand area on both sides of the platform, we're available to serve, to listen, to care. No strings attached. If you're a guest, our servant leaders will be in the classrooms on this side to answer any questions you may have. I leave you with this blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord turn his face towards you and in Jesus' name, give you peace. I love you much. God bless you, Sikkim.